Are they good? Oh, great, good. Uh, I'm so glad everybody's here, and I'm so glad it's not raining, and it's nice under the tent. Um, my name's Jamie Lee Jocelyn, and I will be your guide today. Uh, I am so glad. Can we just first give a big old thank you to Rebecca Soffer for being here? Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to say a little bit by way of introduction. And uh, I keep seeing faces that make me smile even, even more than I already am. Um, so also thank you to the Writers House staff for all of the good hoagie organizing and camera operating and photo taking and oh, book selling that are happening right now. Um, yes, so by, uh, by way of that, we are selling copies of Modern Loss in, just inside that door over there, and they're only $15, which is like a price. This says $24.99. Oh, yeah. You're not going to pay $24.99 today. <laughs> You're going to pay $15. Uh, so you can do that if you want, and I believe after we're done here, Rebecca might stick around for a few minutes to sign your copy yeah, if you want. Um, and this event we are calling... Dead Parents Society meets Modern Loss. And the reason for that is because there are two entities that are sort of like, like cousins. Uh, and Dead Parents Society is a project that we have started here at the Writer's House. We've had a, this is our second live event and we've done a number of podcasts and it's all about write, uh, featuring writing that's about the loss of a parent at a young age. Uh, and I am the, the host of that podcast, and it has been uh, a great source of, of pride for me to, to lead that project. And uh, Modern Loss, which you'll hear a little bit more about in just a moment, is, of course, the name of this book, but also the name of a web community, a literary website, uh, a group on Facebook, and there's just so much to say about it. Um, so. Thank you for being here. And I'm going to sit for a few minutes and we'll get started. And then Rebecca's going to read to us. <laughs> We've got a couple seats up front if anybody wants to move to the front. <laughs> There's a lot of leg room. Uh, Rebecca Sofer, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. I'm like, <laughs> I grew up four miles from here. That's so amazing. I'm, I'm, I love like, that. I feel like I'm back at home. I love that. With hoagies. Yes, with hoagies. <laughs> right. So I feel like I'm back at home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want, before we have you read from the book, do you want to just give everybody kind of an overview of how this project started? Sure. Um, well, I think it's safe to say, um, Maybe it's not safe for some people to say, but for me, I did not necessarily grow up dreaming of, you know, co-founding a website and then writing a book and doing all this other stuff uh, with the theme of loss in the modern age <laughs> and what mm -hmm. it's like to move through it uh, at any age, really, but in particular when you're experiencing it a bit earlier than everybody else around you might be or than you expected you might be. But, um, you know, I started out, I, I went to Columbia Journalism School. I was a producer for the Colbert Report. I had very lofty plans of, um, you know, eventually maybe producing like Sunday morning, like thoughtful Sunday morning pieces <laughs> with Charles Kralt and Charles Osgood. And uh, instead, I got to make fun of a lot of politicians, which was great for Colbert for a overwhelmingly small paycheck. And it was the best thing ever. And then my mom was killed in a car accident. Um, we had, it was my, I had just been at Colbert for about a year. Mm -hmm. I was, th I just turned 30 and she had just dropped me off at my apartment. So this all happened very suddenly. Um, I had seen her about 45 minutes beforehand. We had been on a family vacation right after I got back from the Emmys. The show had been nominated for an Emmy in its first year on air. And um, we all went to LA, we came back. My parents and I went on our annual camping trip. Um, and right after dropping me off at my apartment, very late at night, 
in Manhattan, they continued back to Val Kimwood, which is, you know, my hometown. And I got a call about 45 minutes later saying that there had been a terrible accident mm -hmm. and I really needed to get to a hospital in Princeton, New Jersey, and that my mom wasn't okay. And so that began an entirely new chapter in my existence, both personal, professional, you know, met meta, everything. Mm -hmm. it, it just, it was the moment where life splintered off into a completely new direction for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then a y book happened. Yeah, so um, <laughs> fast forward. Very quickly, it became apparent to me that talking about grief, well, talking about death, we all know is still pretty like overwhelmingly taboo in Western culture. Mm -hmm. uh, you, no one really wants to talk about it. You, when you go to a funeral, you want to see like a nice little box. You don't necessarily want to see what's inside. I mean, I don't want to see what's inside. I don't like, right. you know, crave this type of conversation. But the bottom line is, is that loss and death, it happens to all of us. And so my take is, why not open up the conversation? Why right. not make it something that's not a stigma? Why not make it something that we don't make the other person feel uncomfortable for broaching in casual conversation instead of making them feel like they have to be sanctimonious about how we talk about grief, how we talk about loss? Making, you know, I think that we tend to make people feel like they have to relegate this type of conversation to, say, a religious circle or their therapist's office or a, a circle, you know, a group right. therapy or whatever, and do it in hushed tones instead of, you know, making it just a continuation of conversation at a cocktail party. But we don't do that to people. We primarily make them feel like after the first month that, you know, that's like the worst, worst, worst of it. And that's when, you know, you can stop bringing casseroles and checking in. <laughs> and that after the first year, they're certainly, they've certainly moved on to a much easier state because 365 days have passed. And we all know that that's the hardest right. time when it comes to loss. Well, I think a lot of people sitting in front of us here know mm -hmm. very well, including you and I, that, you know, year two can be even crappier than year one. Year seven can be worse than year three. It's right. just, you know, there's no, loss is not a linear process. Grief has no rules. Grief does not adhere to any, it doesn't give a crap about you actually. <laughs> it has its way with you time and again. Um, and so that's what I realized very quickly after losing my mom, being someone who was 30, who was single, who was living in New York City, working in daily television production at a comedy show, which was, you know, both savior and also like sometimes hell on earth, depending uh, on the day that I was having with regards to my grief experience. Um, but I just felt very isolated. I felt like, you know, I really had to put on this huge facade mm -hmm. every day, going to work, being surrounded by people who were very much focused on building up their lives. Yeah. They were all, you know, in their 20s, early 30s. They were all focused on advancing their careers. They wanted to maybe find a partner and get all these wonderful life trappings that we have. And guess what? You know, I wanted all that too. But I was also very much focused every single second of the day on the fact that my entire landscape of my life had been completely thrown off yeah. its axis. And I had yeah. to navigate that as well. Yeah. And so I got very tired of putting up that facade yeah. and a few years after my mom died my dad died so that was really fun for me <laughs> I was 34 so by age 34 I had no living parents I'm an only child um and it was awful. It was very, you know, existentially awful. And it was literally awful because yeah. I had to deal right. with their estate. I had to pack up their belongings. I had to sell their house. I was 34 years old. And, um, and so out of that came what is Modern Loss, mm -hmm. which was a project that I started with my friend, Gabby. And we, she also suffered the loss of her father and her stepmother uh, at a young age. And we bonded really quickly over those stories. And we just got sick of the stigma. And right. so we realized that what was resonating with us were not, um, you know, inspirational quotes in italics through a heavy rose filter online, which right. had a kitten on it, which like, even though we love kittens, they're adorable. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just want to read a real honest, yeah. messy story about loss and memory or about like the worst day mm -hmm. on day thousand and two <laughs> or on the effect of, you know, what losing a parent might have on you maybe wanting to be a parent mm -hmm. one day. Loss has a very long arc and we wanted to read those stories. And 
as writers, both yeah. of us, we wanted to provide a platform for other people to share those stories. We didn't want to make it our project. We wanted to launch it as a publication. And that's what Modern Loss, Loss came out of. It, we launched it... Um, in November of 2013, so almost five years ago, I was nine months pregnant, which means I'm so stupid. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think have a very a great time to timing. It's a great time to start something. And then yeah. year, and now a few years later, we had this book come out, which I am so proud of. Um, it was this enormous communal effort. And as you said, we have a very, like a thriving Facebook page, a thriving closed face, Facebook page, which I really love. And mm -hmm. um, we do live events all over the country. I do a lot of speaking and all of this came out of just all of this externalization came out of feeling like I needed to internalize it all, which is kind of the wonder of it all to me. I love what you just said because it actually, you just taught me what I think about, <laughs> about this project because one, and also about the Dead Parent Society project because one of the things that drew me to your work and also drew me to the Dead Parent Society project is this kind of balance of external and internal. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, when you go through something like this, and just by by way of explaining, so my mother died when I was just about to turn 13. Uh, so And she died by suicide. And it had been a long struggle with, with uh, substance abuse and depression leading up to that. So this is something I've carried with me. And I'm, I'm also a writer. That's why I get to be here at the writer's house. So that's something I've carried with me for a long time. and. You know, on one hand, you have the very kind of quiet, introspective, internal thought process that comes with writing, which is a quiet thing. And then you have something like uh, listening to a podcast or being at a, an event like this or uh, being on a Facebook group and actually connecting with people mm -hmm. and even having... Uh, read the intro in the book, I know that you and Gabby met through a brunch group, right? The, uh, yeah, a dinner, a dinner right. party a that dinner we went party. to. Yeah. Women with dead parents yeah. was what you called TM. it. TM. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, women with dead parents. And so, you know, you first had that connection and that, that socializing around it and, you know, the good and the bad and the like, let's laugh about it. Let's cry about it, whatever it might've been. And then it became this, uh, you know, I would say, intellectual endeavor as well, an artistic endeavor and creative endeavor. Yeah. And I'm just so uh, grateful for that. And uh, I also think that I've, I've met a lot of people. The reason that we started doing a podcast about this here is because in the Writer's House Kitchen right there, I had a lot of conversations with people from this community who had also lost parents when they were young. Uh, and we at some point joked around and said, you know, it was actually a few other people who had lost their fathers, so they started the Dead Dads Club. I am not part of the Dead Dads Club, which is why I came up with the name Dead Parents Society. And we said, well, what if we were able to actually kind of can these conversations and, you know, be in people's earbuds, you know, or uh, be on their computer speakers when they need us? Because not everybody has the Writer's House Kitchen. Fortunately, you all here you're part of the fam now, so you can be, be in there and have whatever conversations you'd like. But it was the same idea of like, we needed it kind of on an individual basis, but then there was also this community that sort of came yeah. from it. Um, will you read to us, <laughs> Rebecca? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I get so nervous because um, we did a big book tour. We were in about 15 or 20 places for several months all over the country. And I always like shining the light on other people's work. Um, we actually have 40 different contributors to this book. I wrote it very extensively for it. So did Gabby, my, my co-author. Um, but we have pieces by Lucy Kalanithi, whose husband wrote When Breath Becomes Air, a little book that you've probably heard of, one of the most beautiful pieces yeah. I've ever read. Um, people like uh, Michael Greif, who directed Dear Evan Hansen, which is this wonderful show on Broadway that deals deals with stigma, deals with taboo yes. um, head on. And then people you've never heard of who just have really compelling narratives and very fresh voices mm -hmm. and are ready to speak up. So I'm so proud of it, but I've shied away from doing readings, which is why this is kind of 
fun slash wholly terrifying. <laughs> We're all so friends here. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read the intro. The book is divided into different chapters, not based on chronology, because we all know that that would be ridiculous, mm-hmm. um, but rather experiences, umbrella experiences that we felt had bubbled to the surface time and again, variations on a theme. After publishing, we've published now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pieces on modern loss. Um, you know, every type of permutation and combination you can think of on the grief experience along the lines of its where you are on the long arc of it. Um, and so this is from the journeys chapter. We also have things like collateral damage, intimacy, data. But journeys to me is, um, it's called journeys, where we've headed but not necessarily ended up. And to me, journeys can mean many, many different things. And you'll find that within the pieces in this book. And here's my chapter intro. Four years after burying my mom and five days after my dad's funeral, Justin and I landed in New Delhi. Going to India was at the top of my husband's wish list, and we'd planned the trip a year beforehand. We weren't seeking some spiritual catharsis. We just wanted to be tourists and have encounters that were far out of our element. Even though I've had men- I'd had many healing experiences while traveling after my mom's death, I wanted desperately to cancel our plans. It just felt disrespectful to embark on a dream journey when my last living parent had been lowered into the ground just a few days earlier. But the rabbi from my parents' synagogue, a chill guy who could easily be be taken for a deadhead, and honestly probably was, (laughs) reminded me that after my mom's death, I'd regretted not taking more time for myself. Let's be honest, he said over bagels and schmear during the shiva in my parents' soon-to-be-dismantled home. If he were in the same circumstance, your dad would have taken this trip. By the way, are you going to eat that? He was right. (laughs) My dad would have never considered not going. And for me, there was no one left alive to stay for. The second I got off the plane, I felt like I'd arrived on floor seven and a half in being John Malkovich. I've lived in and traveled through multiple countries, but never had I felt so out of alignment. To start, the time difference was 10 and a half hours. So while it was 3.30 in the afternoon for me, it was 2 a.m. in New Delhi. The terminal was teeming with vibrant saris, smoke, and a confusing heady brew of KFC, Domino's Pizza, and Kati Rolls. It was so crowded that I was actually scared to go into the public restroom, lest I never find Justin again and become a permanent citizen of Indira Gandhi International Airport. The car route to the hotel was shrouded in a deep winter fog through which random things would emerge. A Christmas lighted rickshaw, a boy carrying a string of marigolds, a cow. It was creepy as shit. That first day, I was too nervous to eat anything but white white rice from the Westerner-filled hotel, and I showered with my mouth sealed shut. But then I started to relax and, dare I say, kind of enjoy myself. We snaked our way through Rajasthan, then down toward Mumbai. In Udaipur, I got sweet-talked into buying pashminas by a shopkeeper who delighted in modeling them on himself while proclaiming, (laughs) fabulous. I was an enthusiastic token white person at a movie theater in Jaipur, where we were asked to pose for a dozen photos with curious locals. And I didn't think twice before eating an entire bowl of stew ladled out by a man who just sneezed into the cauldron. To be honest, I kind of regret that decision. All of my senses were just stretched to the max throughout the trip. And while emails about estate issues and death certificates popped up on my phone, I had neither the time nor the mental ability to ruminate on my, on my losses. I barely even mentioned them to Justin. They just whirled around with all the other stuff that just made no sense at all in India. Then one day we visited a Jain temple in Ranakpur, 48,000 feet of pure white marble intricately carved into a thousand plus pillars and dozens of domes. It was completely silent. I walked around for the first time since learning about my dad's fatal heart attack, focusing on women's skirts billowing in the wind and the bright stone against the clear sky. A 30-something barefoot priest in marigold orange with Patrick Swayze hair approached. He kindly asked where I was from, surely expecting a simple response like, L.A. Mm -hmm. Instead, perhaps due to that kindness, this was the moment that everything unraveled. I melted into tears, I hugged him, and I told him everything about losing my mother and my father and my unfamiliar new status in this large, chaotic world. He listened in silence, looking at me intently and yet with no judgment in his soft eyes, and lightly touched my shoulder. Probably because, probably because the <laughs> hugging was totally off base. Admittedly, that part does read a bit cliche, but it certainly wasn't planned, and I gave in to the moment. 
Everything looked bleak when we returned home in early January, the saddest time of year in New York. The city was coming down off its holiday cheer, and the prospect of having to deal with a dead dad and all the ramifications of that was starting to form a pit in my stomach. But India's unstructured existence, which seemed to fit so much better with my grief, had fortified and replenished me. I was in a dreary New York with a grim chore, yet I felt ready to do what I had to do. I wasn't surprised by my renewed energy. When I eventually traveled, and frequently after my mom's death, my friends worried I was escaping the inevitable. Many of them assured me that structure was the only way to go, that I was doing the right thing heading back to the daily production of the Colbert Report just two weeks after her funeral, when I was in full-on shock. They said sameness and routine at a job I loved would ground me again and heal me and reorient me to this brave new motherless world. But I was unable to think in New York, especially in the television studio where I was fake laughing at jokes while trying to just shut out images of my mother's mangled corpse in my head. When I hit the road during the show's many hiatuses throughout the year, that's when I could finally think clearly. It was on a sailboat in Bodrum, Turkey, for example, where I decided to break my moratorium on dating and go out with Justin, who'd I, whom I'd met the night before that trip. It was on safari in Kruger National Park, where in the absence of my most trusted sounding board, my mother, I had a conversation with the elephants outside my hut, and we all agreed that it might just be time to leave my job. And it was on a road trip down Route 1 from San Francisco to San Simeon where I thought about the people in my life and considered how to maintain only the positive connections. Coincidentally, that process began the same day I got stuck in the Esalen parking lot. I'd also like to say that sadly I'm not independently wealthy. I just made some highly imprudent financial decisions <laughs> to prioritize these escapes. You don't need to make a Roth IRA contribution every year, right? <laughs> While these physical trips jostled me out of my day to day, they were outnumbered by the ways I began to feel like a tourist in my own life. None more so than reconsidering where home is after losing a safe place to return to time and again. A native Philadelphian, I vaguely assumed I'd just move back here one day, and now it feels as though I'd be moving back to a faint trace of my family. And knowing this, the whole world just seems up for grabs. That might inspire envy in some, but for me, not knowing where to plant myself or decide where home should be has honestly been existential torture. I thought it would get better after having kids, but in some ways it's gotten worse because the stakes just seem higher. Wherever we end up, there will be no trips back home to visit grandma and grandpa on my side, no way to ingrain the place mom came from in their identities. We temporarily tried Austin, where my husband was raised. It's a vibrant and quirky town, and I couldn't stop imagining, though, my son becoming the wrong type of Friday Night Lights character and looking at me as though I were some anxious East Coaster, which, let's be honest, as you can see now, I am. <laughs> we bought a house in the Berkshires in western Massachusetts after my dad died, in part with some of the proceeds from the sale of my parents' place so that I could feel like I had actually had a physical foundation beyond a tiny and impermanent Manhattan rental. But realistically, we don't know how to base ourselves there full time and make both of our careers work. We considered San Francisco where I have many relatives, but it just feels too far from all my friends. So for now, we remain in New York City where I've lived for 17 years and where in spite of the still raw memories of living through the worst of my grief and the fact that it's cost of living will probably decide otherwise for us eventually, feels like home more than any other place. The whole where do I belong exercise some, sometimes feels like the grown up version of a game in my toddler's swim class. At the end of class, the kids sit and splash on this enormous yellow foam duck in the middle of the pool. An instructor spins it and sings, round and round and round we go, round and round and round we go, round and round and round we go, swimming with Mr. Duck, quack, quack, ready, go. And then everyone scramble swims in the direction in which they feel most comfortable. Some parents and kids always go to the same spot, but I, holding my son, who isn't quite swimming on his own, always flail out into a new and random direction. Nomads. Sometimes as I dart around, it feels as though Mr. Duck is just watching me closely, much like the cre that priest at Ranakpur, waiting for me to figure out where to land once and for all. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> so, what we usually do on Dead Parent Society is after our writer reads, a couple of us 
kind of riff for a few moments just about some reactions. Since I'm the only one with a microphone, I'll just do that for all of us, even though I'm channeling Sabrina because she was our apprentice and she's she'll send me the good ideas. Um, but just hearing you read that, one of the things I was just thinking about is how this piece, and now I'm biased because I have lost a parent, but I think this is a piece that would connect with, honestly, anybody who's lived a life. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just looking at a couple of the lines that I underlined as you were reading. Um, you know, you say, outnumbered by the ways I began to feel like a tourist in my new life. Uh, and then you talk about, you say, another result was reconsidering where home is after losing a safe place to return to time and again. And haven't we all at some po point or another in our lives felt like home is shifting or home is changing or home isn't what it used to be, whether that's because of something that happened or we moved or we changed or somebody else changed. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really drawn to that. I'm also drawn to, you're able to, in my class we talk a lot about the emotional volume of stuff, of writing, and you're able to turn it up, turn it down, turn it up, make it funny, make it light, sing a song from the ducky swim class, <laughs> you know, and end I there. I believe I sang for you. <laughs> I, I'm so glad you did. Uh, see, because I'd read we'll this put it before. On Spotify yeah, I didn't that. know the tune, and now I do. Um, <laughs> You're but, welcome. <laughs> but honestly, I think a reason that some people might hesitate to write about something like loss is because you feel like, why would I do that to anybody? Why would I put that out there and be so raw and be so uh, emotional and be such a bummer to everybody? And uh, what this writing and certainly the other writing in the book gets at is, yeah, sometimes you're there and sometimes you really go there, but then other times you're singing the ducky song or you're making a joke and the, I guess the, that leads to my first question I want to ask you. And just so you all know, I have a couple of questions for Rebecca, but I bet, I bet you all have some questions for her too. And Dubois has the microphone. So after I ask a couple to get us started, it will be your turn. And, you know, I am a teacher, so I could give you all <laughs> grades. So I hope you have good questions. But um, I wanted to ask you about your use of humor in particular. Mm -hmm not only because you're an alum of one of my favorite <laughs> shows ever, uh, and Stephen Colbert came here once, and I, I'll tell you all a story about that later when we're all done, if you wanna hear about that. But um, I, you know, in this piece, there's little moments of humor, you know, you call yourself, for instance, the token white person, and you know, you t joke about not saving for your retirement, uh, and I... <laughs> it's not a joke. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, I think in a couple great. decades, I'm gonna realize great. that was not a joke. Well, we'll take you over to Wharton after this, <laughs> okay, and maybe they do. will teach you a few Can things. Can I audit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, when I think of your use of humor, I think first about your first line in the first introduction uh, to the collateral damage uh. section. Can I, is it all right? Sure. It's in the book. It's in, They're it's all gonna in buy the book. Sure. Uh, the first line, eight hours after I'd learned my mother Shelby had been killed on the New Jersey Turnpike, my best friend's husband, Paul, found my vibrator. Oops. So there, <laughs> there we are. Uh, and to me, that line, I mean, obviously that'll, that'll draw him in, right? But uh, it's also just, to me, that's a signal to the reader, like, guys, we're cool. Yeah. Like, weird stuff happens. Uh, even at the most tragic thing. And then you go on and you d explain exactly how this all occurred. The poor man was just trying to help pack her bag, you know, and anyway. Um, but then you're all laughing about it. And to us, I mean, first of all, it's just a great scene. And then it's also a signal to the reader, like, again, that sort of guys, we're cool. We're, we're gonna get through this piece of writing just like this woman got through what she went through, right? So. I guess, will you just tell us a little bit about how you craft that, how you make humor come through in your writing, and also without necessarily being so funny all mm -hmm. the time that we think you're just being like kind of cagey and weird. Right, right. Yeah, I think that it's something. So I think that I, I, working 
So I was a producer for the Colbert. I was a Steven, uh, field producer for the Colbert Report. So I was, I worked on the team that went down to Washington and did the Better Know Just Trick segment. Oh, so yes. I know all these super random facts about all these representatives. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what working on that show for almost three years taught me was, and, and keep in mind, I went right to there from journalism school at Columbia to, I would say, hopefully not the dismay of most of my professors, but I was pretty psyched. Um, I thought that was the best application of journalism I could think of. And um, what that show taught me very concretely is that sometimes the toughest subjects are best served up with a heavy dose of levity. Not every single second, but just when you're at the point when you're either about to broach a topic that makes most people recoil or want to run out of the room or maybe spontaneously throw up or something. <laughs> or when you're at a pivotal point in your narrative where in which you're really going there, like you're really going deeper and you really want to show somebody the, you know, the underbelly of your experience but you don't want to do it to the point, at least I personally, I mean, everyone has their own style. Some people write about grief and it's like really all gorgeous prose and also you want to, you know, just like you're so sad going through mm -hmm. it because it's really heavy stuff and that's their style. My style is that um, grief and loss is a very messy experience and within the mess, there's a lot of humor because it's so ludicrous that like, you know, I gave, give this example in the, in my collateral damage intro that at my mother's funeral, um, I was invited to say a final goodbye to her and they opened up the casket and they put on this like coral shade of lipstick that wasn't hers. And I flipped my shit because like she looked horrendous and she would have never worn that. And I can't believe I actually did this, but I scrubbed it off and I put on an appropriate shade, which is like, I, in hindsight, it's mortifying to me, but <laughs> it's kind of hilarious when right. you, I, I wasn't laughing my way through it, but now you just, you have to hang on to these moments of inanity. You yeah. have to, because it's kind of sometimes what keeps you sane. It is. Totally. Sometimes you have to hang on to something. And so what I choose to hang on to is that ridiculous moment that is kind of funny when you look at it in a vacuum. Right. Um, I also do this very purposely, not only because it's my own personal style and laughter is what has gotten me moving through to some sane extent, losing both my parents before I had children and mm -hmm. they will never meet my parents. I mean, I, you know, became an orphan at age 34, which doesn't sound very old, but you know, I sure as hell felt like a kid when I had no yeah. parents and before I hit 35, um, you know, I do it because it is so messy and I want to show people that in order to open up this conversation, in order to make it something that we're not scared to touch with a 10 foot pole or even a 100 foot pole, you have to make it clear that the water is warm, that it's yeah. okay. Just like, you know, on Colbert, on these shows or John Oliver, God bless him, you know, he can pack, unpack Bitcoin and mm. like, you know, the Russian oligarchy and it could ordinarily be so oh my God, I don't know, so bland or so heady mm -hmm. or just too much to take. But And with loss, it could be so scary. I do it with humor. I just pepper it in here and there to show that you can all be a part of this conversation. It's not something that you have to relegate to your therapist's office or right. to a writing group or to whatnot. You can feel free and emboldened to talk about it to your friends or even to your coworkers right. you feel comfortable with. That's the only way that we're going to change it. And also as these things are going on, you know, Sometimes you show up to your mother's funeral and you freak out about her lipstick shade and it's kind of funny in the I moment. Mean, and yeah. Like, you know, and uh, I actually, I'm so glad. The funeral you, director did not find that so is funny. That right? <laughs> so I, I have to tell you, I actually, the same thing happened at my really? mother's funeral. Yeah. Uh, what it was my aunt who oh my basically in that moment, she saw the lipstick color and was just like, nope. And she reached into her purse oh my God, and that's amazing. the same thing happened. And actually the funeral director kind of assisted with the whole situation. And I was just 12 kind of, you know, in shock or doing whatever oh I was, but God. I was just like, all right, we're doing makeup now. Okay. But, uh, I, yeah, the, I'll just read that line from the, the intro when the funeral guy opened my mother's 
coffin backstage, my reaction was not to throw myself on her lifeless body and sob, but rather to stare at the weird coral shade on her face and yell, what the fuck lipstick did you put on her? <laughs> so as 350 mourners waited in the synagogue sanctuary, I scrubbed the lips of the alien being that was formerly my mother, determined it would not go to its final resting place looking like Tammy Faye Baker. Damn it. <laughs> so good. So Thanks. good. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think... I think again, like we're, I mean, what we're talking about is one of, is basically an unspeakable moment that anybody should have to go through, but sometimes it's about the lipstick shade and some of us have stronger opinions on lipstick shades than others, (laughs) right? I mean, and it's interesting and I want to be able to have questions, but I just want to say like what happened just here is the perfect example of what modern loss is. It sparks right. community. Right. Like, who knew that like someone else changed a lipstick right. on a corpse? Like, right. apparently it's a thing now. Right. If it happens <laughs> twice, it's a thing. I'm, you heard it here. Yes. So like, there are more right. people that happens to. And so by extension, you know, when you share, when I share this piece or when Lucy Kalanithi shares a piece about what she ended up doing with her wedding gown when she married Paul after he died or someone else, you know, it shares the story about what it's like to go through life as a hairdresser after your son dies from addiction, um, mm-hmm. you know, and pretend like you have three living kids because people just want to do chit chat. Inevitably, there's going to be someone who reads that story and is so mirrored in their own isolation that they're just having this exhale when they realize that someone mm-hmm. else is having these experiences. And that's why, you know, I focus on humor and that's why I focus on like, the seemingly inane anecdotes because that's what builds community and that's what emboldens someone else to say, oh my God, that happened to me too. And then by extension, that person feels less isolated and then maybe they share that with someone else and then that person feels less isolated and that's perhaps how you open up a true conversation. That's perhaps, I don't know, like I'm not an academic. I have no titles after my name, Um, but that's maybe, I feel, how you eradicate a stigma. Absolutely. You know, and, and work empathically. I have one question that I'll ask kind of about this, this destigmatizing, creating community, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look to you all, so prepare yourselves. Uh, but I, you know, when we were talking about what our format would be today and we decided you would read something, it was clear to me that you don't always read at these events and you, you know, you were, you were certainly game for it and you read wonderfully and I love the piece you chose, but I get the sense that sometimes for you as the, as the kind of convener of this community, sometimes it, it's less about you. Mm-hmm. It's less about Rebecca reading what Rebecca wrote mm-hmm. and it's more about, right. you know, kind of starting a conversation or even letting the conversation happen or, you know, even giving these other writers in this book a place. And I'm, I'm wondering about how intentional that is, maybe how that, how has that changed over the course of this project? I know some of the, the people in the audience today are, are clinicians or are caregivers in various ways. So I'm thinking about how, and even as a person who teaches a class, that's something I have to think about a lot. So I'm just wondering, how how have you navigated all of that? Yeah, I mean, as I said, this was not my goal in life. Like, I would would say that if I had had a a, a specific choice, I would have specifically chosen for this not to be Mm -hmm. my my Mm -hmm. goal in life. But, you know, life happens. It just is what it is. And I love writing. I love producing. I love editing. I love publishing. And I love community building. So, hmm. You know, it was kind of like I was pushed into this. Modern Loss literally came out of me at a point where I couldn't hold it in me any longer because I was just so driven to do a project like this. And I pulled Gabby into it, who was also so driven to do a project like this and change this conversation and provide a platform for other people because I'm highly aware that the loss experience does not end with like one woman who lost her mom and her dad to a car accident and a heart attack. You know, your mom died by suicide. Um, You guys have your own losses. It might be a mentor. It might be a sibling. It might be, you know, your, your fertility. It might be anything. And loss is loss. Loss isn't even just connected to death loss. But we specifically deal with death loss at Modern Loss because Mm -hmm. I think that there's enough room for that type of conversation. And we try and keep it focused so as also not to go crazy because we're, you know, just primarily one or two people doing this. Um, So building this community became very important because I didn't want it to be about me. I didn't want it to be about Gabby. We wanted to really provide the platform. But in providing the platform, in order to 
kind of get, gain credibility with your readers, you really have to show why you, like why are you doing this? Like why is it you doing this, this website, this book? Who are you and how, why should we trust you with our stories? And so you kind of have to go there if you're asking other people to go there. Mm -hmm. And that's why I go there. And I also, I mean, I love writing, mm -hmm. but um, I don't really feel like I have it in me or want to do a whole memoir. You know, we had the option yeah. when we were talking with our editor and our agent, do you guys want to write a memoir? No, like, oh my mm -hmm. God, like I wouldn't want to read my own memoir. I feel like that would be I really, would read your memoir. Really? Just so you know. Thank you. I would read um, Maybe I'll write a <laughs> chat book for you or something. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I just, it's about everybody else. And I just feel like, you know, this book is so intentionally done. It's so intentionally done with humor. We have... 50 plus cartoons by this amazing cartoonist named Peter Arkel and they're in bright color and they're really irreverent and they really enhance the storytelling where words end this you know these cartoons take over we have illustrated editorials and it's in bright color because you know loss is not black and white Loss doesn't have to be shades of gray. I mean, it is shades of gray, but there's a lot of lightness within that gray. And what we're trying to show is that there's a lot of resilience. And I know that's a buzzword. I get it. Like, you're all sick of that word. I'm sick of that word, too. But, you know, you're resilient. And I didn't think I was. And here I am. Sure. And I didn't know if I would be here at mm -hmm. certain times um, in my immediate aftermath of loss. And by immediate, I mean maybe the first few years. Sure. It took me a really long time to feel like I was seeing some sort of lighter shade of gray. Mm -hmm. And so by inviting a community of people to open up about it, that's, I just feel like that's how, you know, that's how you, you affect people. That's how you help people. Um, because my experiences aren't, you know, page you know, hundred and you know, ninety sixes experiences. <laughs> right. And maybe someone's gonna kind of resonate with page ninety six and right. not with my essay. And I would like to say that um these pieces are really short. You know, they're like fifteen hundred words, eight hundred words, and they're intentionally like that. The book is meant to be put up, you know, picked up, put down, maybe ignored for a month. Picked up again, put down. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's meant to be like that. It's meant to look pretty on a coffee table so that you could feel like this isn't a taboo thing, that you have to shove it under your bed. Um, right. But it's also meant to, like, just hang out there and look pretty and say, I'm cool. Like, you can ignore me. I'll be here, and it's totally cool. Come back whenever you're ready. Mm. Questions. Who has questions? Mingo has a question right in front. Uh, Dubois is going to come with the microphone so the podcast listeners can hear you. I, first, I want to say thank you so much for this because I think um, while, while you've emphasized that loss is different for everyone, I think finding those commonalities can be really comforting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's always surprising to me when it pops up for me, when I, you know, I, I, I was playing darts the other day and I glanced up at a TV set and the Michigan game was on and my best friend who I met at Michigan died this year oh, I'm so and it sorry. just washed over me and first it was total sadness and then it was kind of some joy because I still have that mm -hmm. um, I can still remember all of those years but but anyway my question for you is um, when I've studied uh, nonfiction writing one of the things that has come up is can writing be therapeutic, and can therapeutic writing be okay to share um, in such a broad way? So I wondered how your writing about this evolved, um, if it immediately was something that you felt like you wanted to write about and share, or if your initial writings were more things just to kind of help you through something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, first of all, I'm so sorry about your friend. That just sucks. I mean, there's just no way around that. I'm so sorry. Um, and I hope you get to happen upon lots of Michigan games this, <laughs> this season to remember Thank your you. friend. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, I think that, I think everyone is different. And I do know people who like spit out a book that was like in perfect format within the month after having right. lost um, a really good friend of mine, em Emily Rapp Black, who wrote for this book, and she's this gorgeous, oh my God, like her, her writing is so amazing. She wrote a memoir called The Still Point of the Turning 
world, uh, which is about the experience of losing her son Ronan to Tay-Sachs when he was just a toddler. Um, she wrote the book, you know, while he was dying and the aftermath. It was mm. it came out right after he died. I was not in a I, I was not capable of doing something like that. Right after my mom died, I was in utter shock to the point where I couldn't listen to music for almost a full calendar year. Mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't have known this looking at me if you just saw me on the street. Or maybe if you saw me on the street, I would have looked like that. But if I were intentionally presenting myself to you, you would have thought like, well, she's doing a pretty good job of keeping her act together. But I, I felt like I was hanging on by the thinnest of threads. Um, and so, no, like, no, <laughs> I did not write essays. Um, I barely wrote coherent sentences outside of work. At work, I, I managed to get promoted because I pitched a good piece and I, you know, I could pitch like great political satire stories, but that's because you just, you have to and adrenaline kicks in. When you don't have to do something, it's, you know, it's either gonna happen or it's not. And so for me, my writing, I look back and I did keep a journal. And when I say a journal, like, you know, like three post-it pads and, and like a, you know, an online, you know, like thing that I was scrawling thoughts onto. And they're mostly phrases, you know, short sentences and phrases that don't connect to each other. Mm -hmm. um, because I had, I had, I had a good friend who was um, a writer on 30 Rock and Broad City, and we would do writing exercises with each other, just like little timed exercises. And it really helped me. She kind of made it clear that not everything has to have a point. Um, and so it was a way for me to externalize what I was feeling inside, but without pressure to make it anything that was good. <laughs> and when I was doing these pieces, I will tell you, one of my favorite pieces that I wrote, which is the data intro, mm -hmm. I wrote that the day before my manuscript was due in one sitting. And I had a year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and the I wrote it the day before, because it just was like, I was like, it's not there yet. It's not right. there. And then it just like came out was there that one came out of me and I sent it to my editor I'm like I'm so sorry she's like this is great and mm -hmm. I was like really that's amazing so <laughs> I feel like when you're ready I don't think you can force a lot of things um with right at least I can't force a lot of things with writing so that's my process you know I have to be ready to to go there I I don't want to torture myself I don't want to force myself to unearth memories that are going to traumatize me I did have to remember things that were very traumatic to me but it was not in the early, early days that I was forcing myself to do that. I think that would have been highly detrimental to my well-being. Yeah, it's it's a little different than having a, a journalism deadline or something yeah, like that. Yeah, right. Yeah, I could uh, definitely pitch stories right. about, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> this and that congressperson and, like, why they're totally ludicrous individuals. Right. But, uh, I, not this. I like what you said about sort of the different kinds of writing that can come over time. You know, this idea, like this is something we talk about in class is you don't, fortunately, none of us just have one chance to write about this, you know? So the piece that you write in your journal, notebook, scrap paper on the notes section in your phone is gonna be different than the piece you might write for a project like this or for a web publication or even like a really nice Facebook post on the one year anniversary uh, or, you know, any, I could name all these different examples right now. And I think giving ourselves that space, even if you are taking this on as a professional endeavor, which you have, is still totally allowable and appropriate. So, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and that's what I always tell everybody who writes for us you know, because we're, I constantly deal with people who are writing about their loss. And I'm not talking about like the day after they lost someone. People write about like, you know, 20 years down the mm -hmm. line, they write a finance piece or a sex piece. Loss is everything. I mean, it's fascinating, all the different, you know, that's what I want to underscore, which is like mm -hmm. writing about loss. It can be about mystery and secrets. It's, it can be hilarious. It doesn't have to be sad. You know, that's a long mm -hmm. arc. You know, you have a lot of life maybe hopefully left after you lose right. someone or if you don't you know have a lot of life left your life can still be rich and a lot of experiences can come out of this and so i constantly have to tell people like not to push themselves and I, and if they say they're going to miss a deadline you know this is loss writing. Like, this isn't <laughs> like, you know, Ronan Farrow coming down, like, with a New Yorker, <laughs> right. you know. We need uh, it scoop. today. Mm, yeah. I'm wearing all black. Please notice. But, um, <laughs> you know, this is, I, 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 I want people to go easy on themselves and be kind to themselves. And so if people tend to, you know, if they email me and say, I'm going to miss this deadline, I'm just feeling a little, it's, it's a little hard for me. I'm like, dude, take your time. Like, do you want me to give you another deadline? I will. If mm -hmm. you want me to, and if not, then just take your time. This piece isn't going anywhere. Right. Just sit on it. Come back to it in a month and see how you feel. Right. 
Absolutely. Who else has questions? Okay, we have a few. What I'm going to say is we're going to do the questions. Don't worry, because I actually, I really like all the people whose hands are up. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I am mindful also of the time. So I also want to give everybody else permission. It's 12.56 right now. So if people had only scheduled in an hour exactly for this, please don't feel like you're being rude if you need to get up and sneak out. You can totally buy a book on your way out. Uh, but we're going to also go on and do the questions and stuff. So that's just my little, my little speech there. Um, Navia, did you have a question? All right. Wait for Dubois. Um, hi, I hi. just wanted to say thank you. And it was really um, comforting what you said about not forcing it. Um, because I, I lost my best friend a year and a half ago. Oh, and so um, sorry. thank you. Um, I haven't felt like I was able to write about it until super recently. Um, and now something that I feel like I'm sort of struggling with is um, like, how much of him to share with like the world or even a few other people in my writing um because there's this fear of like I'll write about him and he'll be misunderstood by the person who's reading about it or like this this sense that I have to like do justice to his memory like he would read it and recognize himself or, or something like that um so I guess I just wanted to ask about like how you have dealt with or how you've seen other people deal with feeling like you're, they're sharing that person or mm -hmm. exposing that person to the world. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot of pressure. I think that I'm, and I'm so sorry. I mean, you're so young and you lost your best friend. I'm so sorry. I mean, it's just, it's awful. And the fact that you're even at a point where you want to start writing about it is so commendable. And I hope that it's, it's a worthwhile practice for you um, and I think I think you should go easy in yourself I also think you you can't pressure yourself too much um, again I'm no therapist but I would say I've struggled with this a lot when I talk, write about my mom write about my dad you know I go there I don't like I don't like <laughs> I don't make my dad to be out of to, out to be a saint in this book he was a great I love my dad he was awesome but he was a real pain in the ass sometimes. And after my mom died, he was a very tough person. He, he was really hard on me. He was really, you know, he shoved down his feelings and he dumped them on me. And it was hard. And I write about that. And I write about some of the issues I had even after losing him. Some of the issues that came to light that he left me to struggle with. And uh, I did that. And I felt the need to also, like, I really felt like I had to talk about that because it really is the true loss experience. I felt like I would be sanitizing it if I didn't go there um, and I would be a hypocrite if I were not going there and all my other writers were but I also counteracted that with all the good like a lot of good things about him that were very real to me as well because human beings are fallible and you know we're <laughs> you didn't lose a saint you lost a human being who was a very flawed person because they were human and so you don't have to you know if he was your best friend you know you don't have to like skewer him post-mortem but you I just encourage you to about your own experience you know and you're not doing a journalistic investigation of him or you know stating something or coming up with allegations against him if you're having a memory of an experience with him that's a true experience um, I think you just have to trust your gut and if you're not ready to share that, your gut's going to tell you. And my gut told me, you know, I did, I had one friend who was like, oh, but then you should keep pushing and go here. Mm. Like you're stopping here. And I was like, yeah, because I'm not going there. Yep. And I don't feel that that's the public story. I feel like that's my story. Um, and they don't have to know everything. I think that you just need to do a gut check and your gut is very rarely wrong. But just remember, he was a human being. And he'd probably want to be remembered <laughs> as human and not, like, boring and perfect. <laughs> we, uh, we talk about that a lot in my class, this idea of, like, whose story is it to tell? And not even just when we're talking about loss or death stories, but, yeah, this idea of, like, who am I to write about anybody else? And I think, uh, well, you're someone who was really impacted by this other person, and part of 
this story is your story. And so you might think about with the specifics of it, you know, wh what parts of it are my story to tell? What parts of it, you know, where does that, where is it blurry? Maybe I need to make it clear in the writing that this is blurry or that there are varying opinions about certain elements or something. And that can actually be really interesting in a piece of writing. Uh, but I think recognizing our own authority or ownership of it is, is a big thing that we can also easily talk ourselves out of. Mm -hmm. So I also get the like, you know, hesitancy there. Yeah. Sabrina, did you have a question? Hi, Rebecca. Thank Hi, you Sabrina. for coming. Um, like Jamie Lee mentioned, I was one of the apprentices on Dead Parent Society. So it's really cool to be here at this event and kind of see everything come together. Um, I'm actually also a journalism minor, so I'm curious to see how you feel like your journalism background has shaped or informed your writing in this book, especially since it's like a different medium with mm -hmm. personal essay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm very much like I think that I approach a lot of this writing from a journalistic angle. Uh, you know, we did a whole fact check process throughout the book. Uh, Gabby actually took that on. God bless her. Uh, I was like, I'm good. I was about to have another baby. So she's like, I'll, I'll check the facts. And so she did amazingly. And, uh, you know, we're very, very like, this isn't something where we're like writing memoir and like anything goes. And it is because as you mentioned, it's a literary, it's a literary publication, but I like to think of it as more entrepreneurial journalism. You know, journalism, yeah. it's it's entrepreneurial journalism. And I do speak at the Columbia Journalism School every year um, because that's really what it is. It is, you know, reporting on your experience with loss and you're doing it in a more literary kind of like a, you know, you're doing it in a more feature type format that might be, might be more in Sunday styles as opposed to like A1 of the New York Times. But it's still journalism. And I think that, you know, with, with my writers, um, because loss is this big open like black hole it's like i call it the bottomless pot of coffee you know it's just like you're never gonna run out of angles here you're never ever gonna run out of angles and people always say like oh like how can you work with a publication about loss don't you get bored and i'm like i've literally never published the same piece and i've been doing right. this almost five years right. you will just never run out of ideas and so because of that because we have to have different stories all the time we are very clear our pitch guidelines are very clear like what we do run what we don't run and we say we run very narrowly focused pieces um, around one aspect of the loss experience and so I'm a big you know nut graph person I'm like okay where's your nut like mm -hmm. I don't you know like the pieces that I run to kind of like trail on I really do like them to have a very specific arc and really get to the point um, and sometimes some might say that I'm very like typical essay format type person uh, because I want there to be a structure, but that's specifically because I'm dealing with one genre here. I'm dealing with one big theme. Right. I'm not dealing with all the themes, you know, all the, all, I'm not like writing about shoes and then writing about <laughs> right. politics. You know, within right. loss, we're writing about shoes and politics and yeah. those are the specific angles. And so that's from a journalistic standpoint, kind of how I, how I approach my editing and how I work with writers. Um, and I do a lot of fact checking. Like if they, if they say something, I'm like, okay, like, did this really happen? Mm -hmm. Is it in your mind? Is it your experience? Like you said, is it your experience with them? Or is it something that you heard happen with this person? And I want to be very clear with that. Yeah. Because I'm also aware that, you know, those people's friends and family are going to be reading this piece. Yeah. And we just, we want to do right by everybody. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to go to Julie. I apologize about this noise uh, behind me but Penn's president's house is back there, and I'm sure the lawn really <laughs> needs to be mowed <laughs> right now. <laughs> so just bear with us. Um, <laughs> Julie? Um, I just wanted to say that I really admire how um, bluntly honest you are about your loss. And I really, the, the story about the lipstick really r resonated with me because so many ridiculous things happened at my father's funeral. For example, my grandmother's friend tried to set me up with her grandson, like literally before <laughs> the ceremony. An, uh, why not? <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> obvious. So, you know, uh, Jade, and, you know, like, <laughs> Jade. Often I, I tell that story to people when I first meet them and they first learn, learn about my loss. And oftentimes it helps to, as you said, about using humor in your writing kind of soften the mood and make people feel, feel more comfortable but other times people seem really scandalized that I, I wouldn't say I'm joking about something so sad I, I'm just 
p people seem really scandalized by this idea of lightness as fitting into a story about grief. And I yes. want to know how you kind of deal with that reaction. Yes. First of all, I'm so sorry that you have any reason to, you know, <laughs> engage with this topic at all. You are way too young and it sucks and it's unfair. Um, second, I, I, I hope that the setup worked well. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's interesting, just like as a brief offshoot, I don't know, on the Modern Lost Clothes group, someone just posted the other day, they said, um, has anyone else had anything ludicrous happen to, to them at a funeral? And she lost her son. This woman is maybe like in 50. She lost her son. And she's like, I am just realizing that I called my son's best friend a hottie at the funeral. <laughs> and I don't think that I would have done that, you know, had it, you know, had I not been just in a total state of shock. And like, you know, she's right. like, I literally can't believe I just did that. Or I did that. And it just, it just hit me. The memory just hit me. And then I shared my story, my funeral story, which is great too, I guess. Like <laughs> I could go into a stand-up routine. Um, but I also, um, occasionally, um, so we had this piece run, which we were gonna mention, but like, I don't know if we have time, but it's, I, it's my favorite like cartoon in the book. It's called A Brief Guide to Grief Speak. And it's a lexicon of like the real loss experience, not clinical terms. And it ran as a full page excerpt in the New York Times the week the book came out. And um, you know, we, in the comments section of that, of the, it was in the, uh, the uh, Sunday review section, I was reading the comments and everyone says, don't read the comments. And like, <laughs> fortunately, 98% of them were really wonderful. And they were like, they're so candid. Like, thanks for being so open about the messiness. And 2% were like, these women are so glib. Who are they? They have no respect <laughs> for the dead. And I was like, I have the utmost respect for the dead. Right. I just can't sit around like rending my clothes every day. I just can't do that because my mom would be so annoyed with me. She was this life loving person and she loved me. And I was 30 and I had a lot of life left to live. Hopefully by the time I lost her, she would not want me to go about life doing that. And I did my best to go about life doing that for the first couple of years. And guess what? I was exhausted. I needed to laugh. I needed to live and feel like myself. And so, you know, some of these comments, you're always going to get people who have issue, take issue with your grief. And I'll say something that might be kind of, you know, scandalous, screw them. I mean, really, I don't, I, it's not their loss. It's your loss. And you're a human being and you lost a parent. And you get to live that in whichever way you need to, as long as it's not putting yourself in danger or anybody else. And if that means laughing, go for it, laugh. I mean, my favorite funeral story is um, an ex-boyfriend of mine, his grandmother died, and I know that's, you know, according to nature, but his cousin Stevie, uh, as the casket was being lowered into the ground, there was a gust of wind and the yarmulke blew off cousin Stevie, and it circled like multiple times, and everyone was like, Oh my God. And then it landed six feet down into mm -hmm. the ground on the casket. And there was this moment of silence and everyone was like, Oh my God, it's a funeral. And then Stevie, cousin Stevie, cause that's how he, everyone called him cousin Stevie. He said, damn, that was real leather. And everybody <laughs> just like cracked up because you know, it was funny. It literally was funny. And so, you know, what are you going to do? You got to laugh. Sometimes you're not being disrespectful. You're not being L I T E light. You're being L I G H T light. You have the right to do that. No one, you know, no one has the right to take away your reality as a human being that needs to exist in every different, you know, facet of emotions. I think that is a perfect place to conclude. Um, Rebecca, thank you oh, so much thank you. for being here today, for empowering people to tell their stories, to read these stories, uh, and to just, you know, kind of sit with this in whatever way makes sense at the time. Um, I guess the construction people heard that we were ending. <laughs> this will be so fun <laughs> on your podcast. <laughs> I know. It'll be great. Uh, Thank you for having Just so me. you all know, there's definitely more hoagies inside. There are definitely books inside. Rebecca's going to hang out here yeah. for a few minutes. Thank you all Thank for you. coming. I know this is like a heavy topic for a Monday, but I hope we were able to do it in a way that felt right for people. Uh, yeah. Can I add one thing? Yeah. If any, since this is the Kelly Writer's House, if there are any people here who do want to start writing about their loss experience, 
I accept pitches all the time. If you want to test the waters with Modern Great. Loss, I'd be honored to consider your story. There is a pitch form on our homepage, and you can always flag it for Rebecca on the submittable platform. Um, you know, it's uh, we have a lot of people who publish pieces with us that they don't feel comfortable sharing with the people directly in front of them. And um, we treat every story with, with a lot of respect. So Great. if you're thinking about trying it, and you don't want to like create a blog, say hi to me online. Thanks so much for yeah. that. Uh, and I have some Dead Parent Society decals if anybody Ooh. wants one. Uh, I'll just give it to you. So come see me if you want one. Thanks, guys. Thank you Thank for you. being here. Hi.